Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where I'm asking you, sugar, would I lie to you? People lie all the time. Usually it's just harmless white lies meant to spare someone's feelings. In some cases, avoiding the truth may simply be a strategy to avoid conflict. On rare occasions, someone might lie for fame and profit. This has happened many times throughout history. Some of these historical liars have been so proficient at their craft that they convinced everyone to believe their tall tales. Today we are going to explore some of history's greatest hoaxes. Let's begin with a man who created chaos just to win a bet. Berners Street Hoax Life in London in the early 1800s wasn't entirely pleasant, but those who had money and time could devote themselves to the pursuit of pleasure. One of the pleasurable activities the upper class enjoyed was gambling. Theodore Hook was born in London on September 22, 1788. He gained a reputation for being a brilliant writer. However, he also had a habit of stealing money and going into debt. Theodore's greatest talent may have been his ability to execute practical jokes. In 1810, Theodore made a bet with a fellow writer. He claimed that he could take any random house in London and make it the most talked-about place in the city within one week. The wager was accepted. Theodore began working to ensure his vision would become reality. He began writing letters and sending them to businesses all over the city. Every letter was signed with the name of Mrs. Tottenham. She lived at 54 Berners Street. On November 27th, at 5 in the morning, a chimney sweep arrived at Mrs. Tottenham's home and knocked on the door. The maid answered and told him that the services were never requested. The chimney sweep left, but then another showed up. The maid sent him away, and then another appeared. A total of 12 chimney sweeps had to be sent away. Next, a convoy of carts carrying coal arrived. Then a series of wedding cakes were delivered. Doctors, lawyers, and priests appeared at the front door claiming their services had been requested. The visitors kept coming and nobody knew why. A fisherman showed up at the house as well as a shoemaker. A dozen pianos were delivered to the Berners Street residence. The governor of the Bank of England knocked on the door. So did the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Mayor of London. The side streets around Mrs. Tottenham's home became so congested that it began causing traffic jams all over London. Theodore Hook spent the day watching the chaos unfold from a nearby house. But the pleasure of his well-executed plan wouldn't last long. The next day, a newspaper wrote of the event. Every officer that could be mustered was enlisted to disperse the people, and they were placed at the corners of Berner Street to prevent tradespeople from advancing towards the house with goods. The street was not cleared at a late hour, as servants of every denomination wanting places began to assemble at five o'clock. It turned out that letters had been written to the different tradespeople, which stated recommendations from persons of quality. A reward has been offered for the apprehension of the author of the criminal hoax. Theodore decided to take a tour of the countryside and get out of town. The authorities never arrested him for the prank. He did win the bet, which would be worth about 87 pounds today. Cuttingly Fairies Although adults are usually the ones that create elaborate hoaxes, sometimes children are equally ambitious and clever. Elsie Wright and Frances Griffiths lived near Bradford, England. In 1917, Elsie was 16 years old and Frances was just 9. The two girls and their parents had just recently moved from South Africa. The village in Bradford, where the family resided, provided ample opportunities for the children to entertain themselves. Most days, Francis and Elsie liked to play near a stream. It made their mother mad because the girls usually returned home with muddy feet and wet clothes. One day, after being admonished by their mother for playing near the stream, Elsie and Francis told her that they only went back there to see the fairies. Their mother asked for proof. The children took their father's camera, went to the stream, then returned 30 minutes later with their evidence. 
Elsie and Francis asked their father to develop the photographs. As the images appeared, he could see that one of them showed Elsie playing with fairies. He was convinced it was probably staged by the girls and told them to quit using his camera. Although Elsie and Francis didn't convince their father that fairies were real, they were not done yet. Elsie sent the fairy photographs to some friends in 1918. By 1919, the images had been released to the public. The pictures attracted the attention of the Theosophical Society. It was an organization created in 1875 with the goal of emphasizing the commonality of human nature. Many of its members also believed that everything was undergoing evolution. After seeing the fairy pictures, one of the leading members of the Theosophical Society said, The fact that two young girls had not only been able to see fairies, which others had done, but had actually for the first time ever been able to materialize them at a density sufficient for their images to be recorded on a photographic plate, meant that it was possible that the next cycle of evolution was underway. The pictures were also sent to Arthur Conan Doyle. He was the author of the Sherlock Holmes novels. Doyle was also a spiritualist. Additionally, he was supposed to write an article on fairies for the Strand magazine. He used the photographs that Elsie and Francis took to help prove fairies were real. Several scientists examined the photographs and claimed they were fake. The Kodak company also refused to claim they were real. But the belief and enthusiasm of Arthur Conan Doyle was unaffected. In December 1920, he published an article which said of fairies, the recognition of their existence will jolt the material 20th century mind out of its heavy ruts in the mud and will make it admit that there is a glamour and mystery to life. Having discovered this, the world will not find it so difficult to accept that spiritual message supported by physical facts which have already been put before it. Interest in the fairies began to disappear after 1921. Elsie and Francis went on with their lives, but in 1985, interest in the story emerged again and a reporter found the sisters. Elsie admitted that they used cardboard cutouts for the fairies, but the sisters were too embarrassed to reveal the truth after successfully fooling Arthur Conan Doyle. Francis didn't feel remorse for the hoax, saying, I never even thought of it as being a fraud. It was just Elsie and I having a bit of fun, and I can't understand to this day why they were taken in. They wanted to be taken in. Francis died in 1986. Elsie passed away in 1988. If you would like to learn more about spiritualism, we suggest a previous episode called The Last Witch. Giving Birth to Rabbits For some reason, England has a long history of strange pranks. One of the most unbelievable hoaxes happened long before either of our previous stories. Mary Toft was born near Surrey, England in 1701. She was a peasant and spent most of her life working in the fields. But for a few brief weeks, the monotony of Mary's days would be interrupted by public curiosity. On September 27, 1726, Mary Toft was pregnant with her fourth child. Women were expected to continue working while pregnant, and Mary was no exception. But early in the day, she complained about pain in her abdomen. Shortly thereafter, she began passing pieces of flesh out of her birth canal, but the discarded tissue didn't appear to be human. A midwife appeared the next day to check on Mary, and he was skeptical of the story. But over the next few days, he became a believer. Mary gave birth to parts of cats, rabbits, and eels. One of the reasons why Mary was able to find people who believed her claims was because of a strange belief called maternal impression. Many doctors in the 1700s believed that a woman's emotional state could directly affect how a fetus developed. So, for many in the medical profession, the fact that Mary gave birth to animal parts simply meant that she had been under a lot of stress. The British royal family were curious to learn more about this strange tale, so they sent someone to investigate. The observer witnessed Mary give birth to a rabbit's torso. 
Next, a surgeon was sent to investigate the matter. He was not so easily convinced that a supernatural event was happening. The surgeon said that Mary spent a lot of time keeping her legs and knees together like she was trying to keep something from falling out of her. And the midwife wouldn't let anybody else handle the delivery either. A political writer named John Irve said of Mary, Every creature in town, both men and women, have been to see and feel her. The perpetual emotions, noise, and rumblings in her belly are something prodigious. All the eminent physicians, surgeons, and man midwives in London are there day and night to watch her next production. By December 7th, the ruse was at an end. Mary was finally pressured into confessing. She said that after having a miscarriage, her cervix was still dilated and her uterus was still accessible. So she began having friends and relatives buy animals. She would then shove them inside of her body so they could be pushed out later. On December 9th, 1726, Mary Toft was sent to prison. Hitler Diaries For some people, lying is a way of life. That was the case for one man who created fake Nazi collectibles and sold them for a handsome profit. Konrad Kujau was born in East Germany in 1933. Life was difficult during Konrad's childhood. His mother couldn't afford to feed her children and sent them to live in orphanages several times. Additionally, Konrad and his siblings spent their early childhoods being taught Nazi ideals. As he became a young adult, Conrad found his calling in life. He wanted to be a petty criminal. While trying to figure out how to turn crime into a way of life, Conrad worked as a waiter. But in 1959, he was sent to prison for several months after being caught stealing tobacco and cognac. In 1970, while visiting his family in East Germany, Conrad discovered that many of them had a collection of Nazi memorabilia. This was illegal, but it was also potentially very profitable. He began purchasing Nazi artifacts cheaply in East Germany, then Conrad would take them to West Germany and sell them for ten times the purchase price. Eventually, this plan fell apart when the police found some of the memorabilia and confiscated it. Conrad knew that there was still money to be made in the Nazi artifact trade, but it was too risky to steal items and take them west. So he decided to do the next best thing. He would create his own collection of Nazi artifacts. In the late 1970s, he began painting. The finished artwork, according to Conrad, was created by Hitler. He was able to then convince collectors that it really was from the Fuhrer. The paintings sold for a handsome profit. Next, he began writing notes and claimed the notes were written by Hitler. Collectors believed it and started buying the notes from Conrad. His plan became more ambitious as time passed. Conrad started handwriting text from Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. Even though the original manuscript was created with a typewriter, collectors were happy to buy this forgery as well. Conrad was finally ready to create something far more valuable, so in 1978 he began writing pages of what he would call Hitler's Diary. As he produced new volumes, collectors were waiting and eager to purchase them. In 1980, the journalist Gerd Heidemann heard about these diaries and contacted Conrad. He wanted to acquire the rest of the diary and was willing to pay handsomely for it. Over the next several years, Conrad produced an additional 61 volumes of Hitler's diary. It was sold to Heidemann for around 2.5 million Deutschmarks. A historian in Germany named Hugh Trevor Roper analyzed the diaries and concluded they were real. He commented on the volumes, I am now satisfied that the documents are authentic, that the history of their wanderings since 1945 is true, and that the standard accounts of Hitler's writing habits, of his personality, and even perhaps of some public events may, in consequence, have to be revised. On April 22, 1983, the German magazine Stern held a press conference. The existence of the diaries was revealed and a date was set for their future publication. However, by May 1st, the enthusiasm started to turn into apprehension. Hugh Trevor Roper, after consulting with other experts, changed his mind and decided the diaries were fake. The magazine had paid 9.5 million Deutschmarks to Heidemann for the diaries, 
And now that the public knew the pages were a forgery, the magazine was in legal jeopardy. It was illegal to spread Nazi propaganda in West Germany. And that was exactly what the magazine had done. The editors at Stern, who paid Heidemann, lost their jobs but avoided prison. Conrad and Heidemann were put on trial in August 1984. They were convicted and sent to prison, finally being released in 1987. Upon his release from prison, Conrad had throat cancer, but he also was a celebrity. He continued to earn a living by creating fake paintings. He also forged driver's licenses for paying customers. Cancer finally won its battle against Conrad. He passed away on September 12, 2000 at the age of 62. History is full of liars and thieves, and we've only covered a few of the most interesting examples in this episode. What do you think about these hoaxes? Are they harmless fun, or is it a criminal act worthy of harsh punishment? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Would you like to make sure we keep releasing new episodes every week? If so, then please like this video and any others that grab your attention. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. The only way our strange little channel can grow is with the help of viewers like you. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.